Um, so let me give a little bit of background on Mark. He's a director of IT for Bay East. Uh, he's responsible for managing the association's technology research resources, researching and developing strategic partnerships, business continuity planning, statistical reporting and analysis of MLS data. He holds a number of designations and is a certified ethical hacker. Okay, I'm going to need an explanation of what that is. That sounds scary. And in 2011, Mark was recognized by NAR as Technology Innovator of the Year. So welcome, Mark. Thank you, Kathy. So what is a certified ethical hacker? Well, I'm actually certified to do security penetration analysis on uh, offices, installations. It's on a contract basis. So if a company is putting in something, say a new website, or they're putting in some new infrastructure, and they want to see if it's hardened from outside attack, then I can go and check that out. Uh, basically, whenever you go to one of those websites and it has at the bottom, this is a McAfee certified site or this is a GoDaddy certified site, they've contracted with some certified ethical hacker to do that. Okay, so this is the good hacker. Oh, yeah. It's, <laughs> okay. it's a white hat hacking. Okay, all right. So this is a very broad-based question. Let, let's start with the biggest question of all. How is mobile impacting our industry right now? I think that's a great question because uh, mobile is one of the most explosive areas of growth within technology. Uh, if you look back even five years ago, the form and also the function of the devices that we carry around on a daily basis has dramatically shifted. Uh, approximately five, six, seven years ago, if you had a new phone, uh, at the most you're using it to make calls, send out text messages, and maybe play a game with Brick Breaker or two. But now they're doing everything from measuring the dimensions of a room to acting as you know, fully functional cu customer relationship management systems. Mm -hmm. So all those things adding up, consumers are expecting Git information on the go. Mm -hmm. So you've got two major factors that are coming together. First of all, the explosive growth of information available on the internet, and now the explosive growth of the availability of the information. So the biggest takeaway for both agents and brokers to consider is, Am I available from these devices, and can I give the information to consumers when they need it, and that is usually in front of or immediately leaving the home, and am I able to best respond to consumers' needs? So if a consumer asks or a client asks a broker or an agent a question, it used to be acceptable, I'll go back to my desk, research that, send you out an email, and but now right. it's, hey, respond immediately, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah, there's a Starbucks right down the road, or the school's API scores are this, so the, the agents need to make sure that they have some sort of fluency in this technologies to be able to you know, address those needs for the consumer. Okay, so you mentioned several different things <clears throat> in there. Um, let's, let's break it down. Sure. So, so in the light, a day in the life of a realtor, what might that look like from a mobile technology perspective? You know, that's, again, another fantastic question because I'll wake up every morning and try to think about those kind of those kind of things. And I think the first thing is, uh, instead of having to go to the office to check on uh, where your clients are or what's going on with your searches, you can take out your device and immediately check for your emails. So key one is making sure that your information, your contacts, your emails, your searches, those are all available from the, that mobile device. Uh, going into the office, if you've got some uh, voicemail messages or requests for action or follow-up, oftentimes these uh, components can be performed on the device itself, i.e. sending somebody, uh, forwarding a message, uh, responding to a request, or sending on a uh, research item or whatnot. So again, the component is making the agents more, more uh, fluent and available to answer those questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that you all use here Google Apps, mm -hmm. for example. Yes, we do. So making sure that you're keyed into that so that you have access to your Better Home Gardens resources and your mm -hmm. Google Drive or Google Docs so that you can forward that information on. Mm -hmm. um, making sure that your email clients are set up so you can see any responses that came in overnight. Let's say uh, something changed with the lending or there was a search that came in or you have a new hot prospect. The point being, you don't want to wait until you sit back down at your desk to respond to those. You should just be immediately answering. Yeah, no, that, that's great. What about tracking clients' activity, right? So, you know, you should be knowing at all times, you know, what are, I've got prospects that are on my property alerts, or I've got prospects that are coming through um, open houses and emailing me, or I've got prospects that are receiving my market reports or whatever. 
the great thing about you know our technology now is that we can track you know what are they searching for is that a hot search have they been on my website five times um, well if so then that's a hot search um, and then you can then commu communicate back t basically with a tailored response based on what their targeted activity is so so that's one of the key things that agents, I think, need to really be doing, right, mm -hmm. is, is making sure that they are tailoring their um, responses in a tailored, targeted approach to their clients. Exactly. And knowing what their clients are doing online. Yes. I, I think those are two critical things. One, uh, if your clients are just doing searches and you're being ambushed uh, by the search results, uh, then you're not going to be able to best uh, you know, respond to their needs. But if you're monitoring what the searches are coming in and looking you oftentimes can proactively identify opportunities in the market that would have otherwise been missed. Um, and it, it depends on the systems that you're using. I'll just use an example. We'll say that they've gone into Paragon and they've set up a safe search for their clients and those uh, that email went out. Uh, you notice a particular you know property came across that you think would be a great opportunity mm -hmm. and you might even have some key information in the back of your head about mm -hmm. it. You have the opportunity then to immediately follow up and say, hey, this is a great opportunity for us because of X. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you waited to get back to your desk or waited throughout the day, first of all, you might forget about it. And second of all, you might miss the opportunity for that lead. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very critical that agents are aware that their clients now are taking the home shopping experience all day. You know, the, one of the great things about technology that it allows us to leverage is the ability to kind of multitask. So while you're working throughout your day, it's not like you have to wait until the end of the evening to look at those prospects. Right. If, Remember those days? Yeah. When, when, when a real estate agent, at the end of the day, they'd get home, they'd be out in the field and meetings and events, they'd get home at the end of the day, 6, 7 o'clock, they'd get dinner and they'd sit down and answer their emails. Remember yeah, that? Exactly. And those days are gone. Exactly. Uh, whenever you look at consumer behaviors now, um, the the ex expectation for response is dropping. Every year it's dropping. Uh, you know, a couple years ago it was fully <laughs> acceptable to take 24 hours to respond to an email. And in the latest metrics, particularly with the generational groups that you might be working with, it could be as low as 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Now, wow, I, I 10 minutes. And I, I think it's Brit important. Brittany is nodding her head. 10 minutes. I, I think it's important that not only agents are feeling comfortable responding within those mm -hmm. uh, those time factors, but that they make it easy for themselves to offer fully qualified information. So if they're having to scramble around and look for multiple sources, then they're not going to necessarily be prepared and the responses are going to either A, be missing something, or B, are not going to be fully fleshed out. Mm -hmm. um, so if they're familiar with their phone, they've tapped into, say, you know, Better Home Gardens mobile website or mobile applications or your Google Drive or other resources that you offer them, their textly alerts and whatnot, and are, you know, familiar with reading those reports and taking that information in, uh, then they're going to be that much more prepared to respond very quickly as the consumer expects to receive that information. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. And our agents do have a mobile website through WebTop. Um, that's FYI, in case you do not know, in case you have not searched for yourself in your own website, um, do so and you will see that you do have a mobile website, which is very important. And why is it so important that a website is mobile uh, enabled? So if you look at the statistics of what's driving the internet, uh, actually let me take a step back. Okay. So on, on the internet there are approximately 30% uh, of the, the world population. Obviously there's emerging markets where there's, there's less. Um, but within most of the emerging markets, you're seeing more and more people using mobile. Um, it's less expensive than desktop, provides an on-the-demand, go, on-the-go experience. So if you've only designed your, your site to be desktop friendly, then anybody who goes to your website using a mobile device, they're going to miss out on all your great information. And they're scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, right? Not yeah. a good user experience. Yeah, and there's even sites out there that use like Flash, 100% Flash for their website. Well, it may look beautiful on a desktop, and it may capture the entire experience and the brand that you want to do, but if all the consumer sees is a blank page, all they're going to know is, I received a blank page. Yeah. And consumer, not, not good. Yeah. Yeah. And, and consumers' attention spans are much like little children. Uh -huh. you know, once you lose that attention span, it's mm -hmm. really hard to capture it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're talking about me there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Super, super impatient. And uh, most of us are becoming more impatient as these apps make our 
uh, lives easier, right? Mm -hmm. um, everything from uh, using your mobile to write your grocery list, uh, to keep your passwords, to do your banking. Um, consumers uh, are using mobile more and more. I made the comment the other day that I would rather lose my wallet than lose my phone. Yeah. I, I, I think that I think that's actually true of a lot of people. I mean, with my phone, I could disable all my credit cards, yeah, and I yeah. can still manage to get around, and probably even do a little bit more effectively than if I have my wallet. Yeah, I, I know several agents that actually sleep with their smartphones. So you know, <laughs> there you go. All right, good. So let's uh, let's go to the next question. So um, email and smartphones. So any tips for email campaigns? What kinds of things here do you recommend for agents? You know, this is a this is a big area that I don't think a lot of people give a whole lot of thought to. And a large part of my job is thinking about uh, user experience. Uh, when you send out an email campaign, it's really easy to structure a nice, well-written campaign. And they look beautiful. But again, just like the mobile, the mobile versus the desktop version of the website, the mobile email capabilities are a lot different. Uh, I know for myself, I get a lot of email. I'll get anywhere from three to 500 email messages a day. Oof. Yeah, and a lot of them are spam or bacon, you know, spam that you subscribe to. Right. Uh, what, what, what's that? What's that? Bacon? bacon? Yeah. What's bacon? Bacon is spam that you subscribe to. Uh -huh. So like, let's say you go to Kaiser. So it smells good. Yeah, you yeah. go to Kaiser, you sign up to receive an alert, you set it I okay got to get it, but you're okay. not really going to read it on a okay. daily basis. Right. Uh, so that preview pane is very critical for mm -hmm. me because I can get a really quick uh, decision on yeah. whether or not this is worth my time. Well, if you look at the vast majority, and I, I'm saying probably around 90% of email campaigns that are drip campaigns that come, at least to me, uh, you'll, the very first thing that you see in that preview campaign is to unsubscribe, click here. Mm -hmm. Well, if the first message that you're giving to a consumer is the instructions on how to leave behind your email, and not actually not explaining mm -hmm. what you're going to be getting from the email, why would necessarily somebody run through and read it? Mm -hmm. So that's one question to ask for. Second thing is, is, again, like a mobile desktop, you can design it with hard uh, set font sizes, colors, mm -hmm. but you got to keep in mind that not uh, most desktops are going to have larger font reach, so mm -hmm. more installed fonts. Um, so that font that may look beautiful on your desktop mm -hmm. may not show up on that mobile device. Mm -hmm. And then the final component so is... keep it simple. Keep it simple. Uh, those images. You know, oftentimes they'll have, like, heavily laden image rich, and the images are communicating the entire email itself. I got one that was basically instructions to unsubscribe, some tracking information, and then the entire message was uh, an image. But the image didn't load on my phone because it was too mm. large for the phone, and the phone said, do you actually want to load this image? And I didn't want to at the time. So I looked at it as an experiment, and it was uh, the entire meat of the message. And that mm. came from Amazon. So even the big players are still kind of struggling on understanding mm. the difference between desktop and mobile. So for, for clients, uh, for agents and brokers themselves, when they're thinking about their drip campaign, you got to realize that at least 50%, if not more, are going to be reading this information on mobile. Mm. So when you okay. send out that test message, make sure you open it up on your mobile device to see how it's rendered. Mm. Uh, when you're selecting a jerk campaign selector, um, look for a theme that has mobile support built into it. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure Better Homes and Gardens uh, has some wonderful campaign generators. Mm -hmm. But if they don't, uh, MailChimp is a fantastic tool. And they have lots of templates built into it. And it also allows for transactional emails, which are messages that are sent on the behalf of a system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, good. This is great. So just in summary, your, your recommendations are to use your pre preview pane. And by the way, this is in your um, Google uh, Mail yeah, so if or Outlook if you use it. And Right. So if you were to open up your iPhone or your Android device and you click on the Mail window, uh, when you get the list of messages, you get two sentences that usually gives the topic of the, the message. Mm -hmm. So first task for agents is send themselves a test message and see what are mm -hmm. the first two lines that comes in. Personally, I suggest that the first two lines be a call to action. Mm -hmm. Click here for an amazing deal or uh, read this market report or mm -hmm. this is mm -hmm. going to save you money or don't miss out. Something that's going to grab the consumer attention so they feel the desire to, to read it. Mm -hmm. Second thing is then once they've looked at the preview pane, open up the message. See how mm -hmm. the message actually looks. Is it dependent on some sort of image? Is it dependent on the fonts? If it is and it's not working correct on your phone, 
then uh, go back and revisit. And then finally, don't just check it on one device. Try to go around to some of your coworkers or team members and see how it looks across a multiple number of devices. Particularly within the Android market, this is important because not all of them are going to have the same screen size. Mm -hmm. You can kind of get away with just checking on one, let's say, iPhone, because they're all basically the same in terms of screen size and dimension. Mm -hmm. uh, but within Android, BlackBerry, and Windows, uh, it suddenly becomes a whole other game. But, you know, before you have, like, a heart attack on it, 99% of it is checking to make sure that preview call to action exists, and that it's not overly dependent on... Uh, Particular image on a particular order. image, okay, and and keep it simple in terms of font. Yeah. Open, test it, um, and uh, make sure that you have your call to action up front. Yeah, yeah. and also Great check advice. your reply to as well. Mm -hmm. um, Why is this, that important? This is a big one that I see uh, a lot of times. Is it will reply to some email. It'll even say email doesn't exist or don't bother me. Dot blah blah blah. Dot mm -hmm. com. But your reply to should always go to somebody who has an opportunity to, sure. to reply. Mm -hmm. Again, the consumer, particularly when they're reading this on a mobile device, the expectation is that it's information that they can mm -hmm. be uh, involved in. Mm -hmm. So if you're going out and I experience this. It's supposed this to be whole, interactive. Yeah. That's the whole so point of email. Have you ever like gone out and looked on Yelp? for, say, a restaurant, and mm -hmm. then tried to call the restaurant, either didn't right. have a phone number. Very or frustrating. Just yeah. move on to the next right. restaurant. Well, if you press respond yeah. and the email bounces back to you, hey, email address doesn't exist, right. you've now lost credibility for that. And, and that happens a lot, actually. Yeah. There's a fair amount of companies out there, even health, com even yeah. companies that you subscribe to, news organizations that are credible, mm -hmm. and they'll send you emails that are from no, no reply. Yeah. And you, if you, so that is a frustrating experience, definitely. And the other thing uh, that we found within our own marketing uh, journey, as it were, uh, you got to send it from somebody. It mm -hmm. can't just say email sent from campaign generator one, two, three. Mm -hmm. Consumers are looking to have a personal connection mm -hmm. with somebody else. Mm -hmm. So if you have an email that comes from Kathy, it should say, email from Kathy or Kathy Sells or Kathy Cares or right. Team Kathy is awesome or whatnot. It's just mm -hmm. something that's going to let the consumer know that this isn't just a blind robo email that's going out. There. Right, right, absolutely. And so, you know, if, if for the agents that are in the audience that are not already signed up on Drip Email with their clients or the market reports, all of the Drip Email and market reports that come from WebTop are personally branded to you, the agent, with your photo, contact information, as well as the no subscribe. But there's no reply. There's no no reply. So uh, that's great advice. Yeah, you know. that's fantastic. Great that y'all give up those resources. Okay, good. So let's talk about some of the best apps that you recommend. This this is a this is a big can of worms. This is a uh, this could this could be a long discussion. Um, but but if you were to, to shorten it, I don't know, to maybe the top three apps mm -hmm. for agents and, and maybe a couple for teams. Let, let's talk about what you would recommend. Our agents love apps. Yeah, as you said, uh, this could be a topic on itself. Uh, actually, I just gave a presentation at uh, CAR California Association of Realtors Expo talking specifically on this, and it was an hour-long presentation. Wow. So. Well, well, we'll have you come back for, for that one. How about that? <laughs> Love to. Uh, the very first thing I would suggest to all agents, if they have not done it, and brokers alike, make sure that you've signed up and connected your Better Homes Gardens Google Apps to your device. Mm -hmm. um, getting in that calendar, getting in that email, getting access to your documents on the go, that's absolutely critical to remaining productive outside of the office. And really plug in and explore the calendar. I, I think a lot of people, they just look at the calendar as, here's this basic calendar, but it has a lot of layers of complexity to it that can allow you to do some pretty phenomenal things. For example, you can create a team calendar and invite and join, have several people within a team mm -hmm. join the calendar. So maybe you're not available for a particular event or opportunity, but you can kick it over to somebody else within the office. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then you can also know where people are on your team. The second thing is, is uh, FaceTime or some mm -hmm. sort of face-to-face -face communication element, maybe Skype, maybe you know FaceTime, maybe Uvu, whatever it is. That ability to kind of have a conversation with somebody else within your team or a client can be really powerful. So for the audience, it, it groups in the audience that don't know what FaceTime is yeah. or Skype, what is that? So FaceTime is an application that's provided by Apple for Apple devices specifically that allows one Apple device to vid initiate a video chat with another Apple device. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty popular mm -hmm. and 
in the same space also on Apple and Android and Windows is Skype. And Skype is a popular video chatting one. And Ubu's like Skype, uh, just probably not as Ubu. O O B U U. Um, okay. It's it's another one. I personally would recommend Skype rather than this off by one one, but okay. it's it's uh, some people find it nice. Okay. Um, so those those are one of the two things, and I, I think look for creative ways to use those items. For example, let's say you're at a uh, open house or you're at an opportunity or whatnot, taking out your device and sharing some pictures with your clients mm -hmm. can be a really powerful thing. Or even showing them some video or, you know, asking them a question rather than just, you know, calling them on the phone, actually getting to, to read some facial cues. So mm -hmm. that's why I recommended that, that one. Uh, for teams and for agents, I would heartily recommend looking at both Evernote and Dropbox. Mm -hmm. I find Dropbox to be my must-have app. Uh, simply because it allows me to sync my information together from my home, desktop, mobile device. And so I'm never left in the dark with without having something that I've, that I've worked on. So how so Dropbox is you can actually upload documents mm -hmm. to Dropbox and then have them in the cloud and download them. How is that different from Google Docs? Well, there's a couple key differences with Dropbox. Uh, Dropbox, I, it, it doesn't matter if it's a document or if it's a song or video or whatnot. The other thing that okay. Dropbox makes it really easy to do is to collaborate uh, so that you can actually share across a team. So for example, let's say, you know, Kathy was out in the field and I had put together a fantastic presentation on REO short sale process, uh, but you didn't have that information in your hand. If we were in a team together within mm -hmm. Dropbox, you could access the shared folder Mm -hmm. and have access to that presentation which you can just immediately show. Mm -hmm. The other key thing that Dropbox allows you to do that Google does also allow you to do but doesn't quite make it as easy is the ability to share files as, as links. So if you've ever gotten that email rejected by server because yeah, file size too large. is too large. Just got that yesterday. Well you can right click on any file within Dropbox and choose copy link mm -hmm. and paste that link in the body of your email and then that person will be able to download and open that that, uh, okay. that link. Uh, this can also be very useful for websites. Let's say you have a particular document or something that you want to mm -hmm. update on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. You could put that link on your website, and then just when the document needs to be updated, you change the you just write over the old document. Yeah, great. So you're you're not supporting that document. Dropbox yeah. is. And we got a question from the audience. Are you using a free Dropbox account? Are there different sort of menu levels for Dropbox accounts? Yes. So I've used all of them. Um, we currently are employing Dropbox for Teams within our office, which I gives a, which I believe at the level that we're at gives us one terabyte of storage. But if you're not using it, don't feel like you have to go out and buy something. Uh, you can start for, certainly start with the free. And Dropbox offers a really great, uh, basically, pyramid scheme. So <laughs> the more people you invite to it, the more free space that you're going to ah, get. Okay. So it's a very generous, uh, it's a very generous helping of, of space. Where I think most people get kind of bent out of shape as they try to, you know, put all their pictures and their videos right out of, out of the box. Uh -huh. But really, if you're just looking at your your slideshows and your um, documents and your templates, the stuff that's going to remain productive in the, the field, two to five gigs is going to be fine for most folks. Gotcha. Okay. So Google Docs then. Explain to the group, because we are, we've mm -hmm. transitioned to Google Docs. We're about 80% transition for the company, and pretty soon we will all be using Google Docs, the entire Google system, and the cloud. Mm -hmm. So how does Google Docs differ from Dropbox? So first of all, Google Docs is going away. Okay. And it's it's not going to be Google Docs anymore. It's going to be called Google Drive, mm -hmm. uh, and that is their response to to Dropbox. Okay. I I think that you can accomplish ninety nine percent of what uh, Dropbox and Google Google or within Google Drive. Mm -hmm. But one of the really nice applications of Dropbox is it gives you a great mobile app. So either for iPad, the uh, the Android tablets, or for your, your smartphone. You can open up this Dropbox app and be able to access the documents on, on the mm, go. Okay. And again, that's, let's say you're good. sitting with a client and they ask a particular question. Well, how's that going to work for veterans funding? Well, you could have within your team or within your office or your branch or even as BHT as a group, mm -hmm. you could have this one folder set up. We'll call it, you know, sales recovery assets. And you just, boom, open up this presentation and just go right through it like you had that information always on your hand. Great, great, great idea. And more and more, that is what 
what uh, consumers are expecting. And another area that you can use uh, Dropbox that wouldn't really work for Google Drive is let's say you have a particular file. Um, so I, I use a lot of snippets mm -hmm. because I write code and whatnot, but also in responding to folks, I use like a snippet manager like Text Expander. Or is, is, that, is that like a, a um... yeah? So I can put in like PHP and then a oh, you know, okay. asterisk behind it, and it'll automatically okay. put in the code for me. Okay. But you can also use it for emails. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have a canned email that you want to use. Well, I use snippets a lot. Rather than reinventing the wheel on each computer that I go to, I can actually store those preferences within Dropbox, and each one of the applications I install can pull from the same preference file. Mm -hmm. So if you have applications that you use both at home and at work, one of the unique things about Dropbox is you can share those kind of preference files. So just like as if you're sitting at your desktop at work, you're getting the, the same productivity flow that you've already set up and spent so much time. Mm -hmm. So it really just allows you to, you know, you stop reinventing the wheel every time you mm -hmm. set up a new computer. Okay, good, good, great stuff. All right, good. Um, do you have one one uh, app for Teams that you recommend? Well, Dropbox certainly. Okay. Evernote. Evernote, Evernote is really, really powerful, um, particularly if you're working in a team that you want to have. Uh, a sales channel set up. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe you have certain handoff points or whatnot. So one person goes out and handles in this this portion. They save a note. You'll share that that notebook across each other, and then the next person just picks up that notebook and goes along with the next stage of the. And also channel. with Evernote, I love Evernote too. And you can take photos with Evernote and then put them into the same uh, yep. folder. It's great. You could even use Evernote if you want to type up your grocery list and, and get to the. That's what I use it for. Get or or for things to remember or um, for items for a meeting or whatnot. Um, if you're at a conference, take notes and then you can send it to. You can save it to your work. And, and integrate it with your laptop. Um, one area that would be particularly useful for agents, though, and for brokers and for risk management, is you can come up with an Evernote form for, let's say, an inspection. Mm -hmm. And then when you do the inspection, it's saved in Evernote. Your broker manager, your team member would be able to have access to that information. And you don't have to worry about it getting stuffed in a drawer somewhere and uh, losing it. Great, great, good stuff. Okay. All right, Mark, so next question. Effective contact relationship management. So CRM is one mm -hmm. of the things that is, um, I, I would say, if, if we had to say uh, there's one technology that is the most important in our business, it's a CRM, right, is to make sure that our agents have a, a database of their mm -hmm. sphere, of their farm, the people that know them, love them, and trust them, mm -hmm. um, in a CRM d database management. Now, we have the web top, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we uh, and that is a da database management system. So agents that are on our company can actually then send newsletters and market reports and all all of that kind of thing. But there are a lot of a lot of different CRMs that are out there. What what do you recommend? Well, first, I, I would absolutely recommend that your agents and your brokers uh, make sure that their phones are connected to Google Apps. Because the the first key to this is making sure that you have your contacts on the go. And it doesn't any contact relationship management where you're having to manage multiple different lists of contacts, one on your mobile, one on your desktop, one on your home PC, you're going to lose consistency really quick. The uh, second thing is with, with anything like this, agents and brokers need to sit down and kind of plan out what it is that they want to track. And I'll, I'll give you a specific reason. Uh, we had a member who brought in their uh, phone. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but our association offers uh, members free two free computer repairs a year. Mm -hmm. um, so she brought in her phone, and she was really frustrated because she had over 1,200 contacts in her phone, which obviously her phone was not designed to do that. Uh, and she was tracking on each one of these contacts, like separate notes and mm -hmm. whatnot. Mm -hmm. And whatever happened, uh, there was some sort of cloud syncing issue where she got duplicated. Mm. And it duplicated several times. So she went from 1,200 contacts to like 8,600 uh -huh. contacts. And our, our task was to try to like, you know, figure out and merge that information together. Well, I learned one, one thing very quickly. Notes are not exportable mm. <laughs> from, uh, from there. So we, we came up with a creative solution. Uh -huh. We automatically got, we ultimately got her healed. But uh, whatever one core piece of information that you have on there, you need to make sure that that is back it's able to be backed up. Okay. Um, so again, the first connection is making sure that you have your contacts centrally stored and managed. I would suggest that they use Google Apps. Second thing is to choose a solution, and one of the nice things about Google Docs, which you have 
converted your folks to is they can create forms mm -hmm. and those forms can actually be stored as spreadsheets which are accessible on the go mm -hmm. um, so you could create a form or template for tracking that information mm -hmm. hey met with this person this interaction and it's going to be stored in the cloud you're not going to have to worry about mm -hmm. it so it could be uh, folks that come through your open house you could create yeah. a spreadsheet of all the folks that come in with their contact information if you exactly. follow up later with your database management okay exactly. good nice or you can go with the third-party software. Um, there's a couple of nice ones out there. One that comes to mind is Bento, mm -hmm. uh, but that's specifically an iPhone, uh, iOS one, but mm -hmm. it, it makes it really easy. There's a lot of those, aren't there? Zoho uh, is a free service. That Zoho, Z-O-H-O? Zoho, Z-O-H-O is okay. a free uh, CRM okay. service. All right. Okay, good. All right. Database, very, very important. Uh, so final question, Mark, um, is should I build a mobile app or mobile website? Well, we've already touched on the mobile website. Our agents do have a mobile uh, website. What kinds of mobile apps uh, are agents and uh, agents thinking about? Uh, it seems like a lot of work, a lot of lift and haul mm -hmm. for an agent. We have mobile apps. Uh, brokers have mobile apps. Um, Realtor Association have mobile apps. Um, what, what is your thought on that? Well, so most of the time when you talk to agents or to broker producers, uh, they are looking for, in a mobile app, a way to connect a consumer to them when they're searching for homes. Mm -hmm. And the very first thing I suggest is you got to make sure that your website uh, functions uh, mobily. And if your website isn't functioning mobily, then stop even thinking about a mobile app and making sure that, just make sure that your website works mobily. You already saw that, that piece of the puzzle for them by offering them the Better Homes Garden mobile site. Uh, so if they're looking at a mobile app, the biggest question that they need to ask is, you know, am I trying to reinvent the wheel? Am I trying to address a problem that's already been well addressed out in the field? Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, it's a matter of selecting a developer to go through. And it's not simply designing for one device. I, I think that's where a lot of folks kind of you know, miss the boat. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't just simply say, well, I'm only going to de develop for Android or I'm only going to develop for the iPhone or I'm not going to worry about Windows because they only have 3%. You're working with a wide range of consumers and you don't know that that Windows user is <laughs> going mm -hmm. to, you know, be the guy who's going to buy a house from you. Mm -hmm. So uh, you've got a plan on, again, what am I trying to solve and do I need to have it for all of all devices. Now, if you have those two questions answered and you feel sufficiently, at that point, really take a look at the market and see what other people have done within it. And again, if you're if you're trying to reinvent the wheel, kind of ask yourself some yeah. questions. Why? Not a good use of your time. Yeah, no. but if it's a totally unique, great idea and something that you could use, then the way to go about it is selecting a developer um, and then choosing a pricing scheme. I will tell you, particularly within the consumer space, it's going to be difficult. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. I do want to make a point that we at BHG actually has a an app called Town Select. Okay. Um, and it's through iPhone, so mm -hmm. you can go to the iPhone store and download it. And to your point, Mark, um, agents want something an app that's going to tie a consumer to them. And that's mm -hmm. a really great point. Mm -hmm. So how Town Select does that is an agent can go can give it to their buyer to download. Um, once the, down, the buyer downloads it, they can go to, let's say they're going to go on a Saturday, they're going to five or ten open houses. Um, and they can take pictures of the kitchens, they can, um, you know, whatever pictures they want. And it actually creates a folder for that particular home, right? So 123 Main Street is going to have all the photos from that. Because, you know, you get home at the end of the day and you're like, wait, which photo was for which kitchen, was for which house? At the same time, in that particular area, it has full access to school information, crime information, all the housing data through onboard informatics. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a cool tool that is available to our agents and that ties that consumer to them. So I would suggest that the agents who are going to use that app, first of all, download it and make sure that they're familiar with it because the worst thing to be is uh, ambushed by a question. Great point. Uh, second yeah. thing is uh, add a link to it on your, your, your website. Okay. So that when a consumer goes there and they're on their mobile device, say, "Hey, you're on our mobile, you're on our mobile website. Make sure you get this awesome, you know, town app so that mm -hmm. you can get this and sell it. Yep. Uh, explain to them why the consumer is going to want to do it. And then when you're talking to your clients, you know, say the same thing. Hey, have you downloaded this? And maybe even include it within your drip campaigns and follow up. Actually, try to use it. I think that's going to impress consumers more than anything else." Uh, the reason why consumers go to apps like, you know, Trulia, Zillow, 
you know, other third-party apps is because they're not familiar with them. So mm -hmm. if you have an app that's tied to your brand, mm -hmm. if you have an app that you're fluent with, they're going to mirror you. Mm -hmm. They're going to use it, and then they're going to tie themselves to you. Okay, cool. Um, so we're going to go off script just for one minute. Sure. If you had, um, you know, if you were sitting in front of a, of a group, a room full of realtors, you know, like you are here, the millions and millions of people in our audience today, um, what would you say down the road are a couple of the kind of sexy, cool mobile apps that are coming? Well, I think one of the really uh, awesome ones that are, that are coming out is there's this uh, tool called Aurora Sama. And what Aurora Sama allows you to do is generate auras for pretty much mm -hmm. anything. Cool. So you can take a picture of a blackboard, and based on proximity, location, and the image itself, you could overlay a video on it. Uh, you can have a call to action. So it allows for interactivity. In fact, there's a great TED Talk uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with TED, TED is a resource where thinkers and knowledge speakers from around the world gather and share great ideas. And it's it's about Aurora Sama, and they show things like how to set up a router on the go with this device. And it's, it's pretty amazing and awesome. Second thing is uh, we're going beyond just QR and augmented reality. People are starting to think about uh, how different gesture-based systems mm -hmm. can work. Uh, there, I even read one about a sound-based uh, linking system, um, and I have seen in a um, practical application, there's some text translators that will translate on the fly, mm -hmm. and even uh, text tra or voice translators that will translate on the fly. Uh, Say it is a 99 cent app, and I'll translate, and I've tested it, my wife speaks Chinese, mm -hmm. it will translate from Chinese to English. Wow, you're great. You're dealing with like a you know, a buyer who has a family member who really has a, per, a point that they want to share but can't really get it across, mm -hmm. this could be a great way to kind of connect the dots. Okay, great. Well, Mark, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come up and talk with us. You have given us a lot of great tips. You obviously are, you know, uh, very, very knowledgeable in this, and I know our agents in the audience got a lot out of today. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. All right. All right. Next, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Brittany Paisal Black. Um, to the group. Brittany um, is a, let's see, she began in real estate about three years ago and she joined the um, team, top racing team, the Platinum Group in Danville and, and, and actually the group was the number two team in the entire company in 2011. So Brittany uh, has since gone, struck out on her own and she uh, is doing a lot of work with uh, younger buyers. She's working uh, with, almost exclusively with really Gen X buyers. Um, and she's got a lot of first-hand experience about what they expect, what their experience is right now that I think uh, a lot of folks in the, in the audience can benefit from. So welcome, Brittany. Thank you. Yeah, congratulations. By the way, I forgot to say Brittany is newly pregnant. <laughs> Four and a half months. Four and a half months. So she is, uh, she is uh, juggling a lot. So, Brittany, um, you know, Let's just jump right in and say, you know, how do you interact differently with younger buyers, let's say, in their 20s than older, those of us who are baby boomers? Um, you know, this is a big, broad question, too. We could probably have a long discussion about this. But if you had to, to, to capsulize it, what, are the, what, what is your experience? Uh, the expectations of the different age groups are completely different. Um, they're becoming more similar as technology does become more prevalent. But um, they're still they're still really different. Um, the the younger buyers, it's it's almost unheard of for me to go a full day without getting a text message or a phone call or and sometimes multiple. Whereas with the young or with the older generation, they they don't expect that immediate have to respond. Um, I don't ever go a full day without responding, just because that's something that I pride myself in which is um, just being very responsive, and I know that, that all my buyers really appreciate that. Um, but for the younger buyers, uh, constant text messaging. I have some clients who, if they're active buyers, um, they'll just text me an address, and I just know, okay, that means look into this specific property for them. Um, and there's lots of emailing that goes on. I, I have phone call conversations with my older buyers a lot more than I do with the younger buyers. Um, and it's kind of nice because I can respond when I want to and 
um, if I'm doing something, if, I, um, if I'm not showing property or something like that and I, and I do get a text from a client or, or I do get a call, I send them a text message real quick and just let them know, you know, I'm with a client, I'll, I'll give you a call or I'll text you, I'll look up this property for you as soon as I get back to a computer. Um, so technology has made things a lot more easier um, and, and they expect me to respond really quickly um, and, and I don't mind that but, but sometimes they can get a little bit impatient and it'll be like 10 minutes I'll get like two text messages in my phone call. <laughs> um, so, so if you don't respond to that text message, they text again. Oh yeah, I have some, yeah. I have some. <laughs> in the, in, Serial um, texters. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Whereas um, the baby boomer generation, I, 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 that would never happen mm -hmm. with, with any of them. In fact, I even have some, some clients who, who don't even know how to text message. Mm -hmm. So um, everything's done over the phone. And uh, technology has made things so much easier these days, like with DocuSign mm -hmm. and, um, and everything. And my, my younger clients, they want to use DocuSign. They don't mm -hmm. want to have to print anything. They don't want to deal with facts. Mm -hmm. they, they love it. Um, whereas a lot of my other clients, they don't even understand. Like I'll try to, I, I just sold a property in San Francisco and, and uh, my clients were older. They lived in the house for 30 years. And they, they were telling me, oh, well, we're going to be going on vacation, so if the house doesn't sell before we go on vacation, you know, what, what are we going to do if you need any paperwork from me? And I said, oh, my gosh, we'll tell you, know, there's this thing called DocuSign. It's so awesome. And so I, I sat them down and actually tried to show them on their phone, because um, she did have an iPhone, mm -hmm. um, how she could do it, and she was just so lost. Oh. So, um, yeah. So, so she so opted funny. not. Yeah, opted exactly. Not. Okay. So I, in, in, um, and it is so nice to be able to use the technology because with these particular clients, I was driving to and from Castro Valley quite a bit just to get them to sign papers mm -hmm. um, because they, they, and they still use a fax machine. So if it was like one or two papers, it could be done through fax. But if it was much more than that, it was we meet in person and, mm -hmm. and go over everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so how, how does the property search work differently? So, you know, you're working with a 22-year-old first-time home buyer versus a, let's say, 42 or 45. I think the average age of the first-time home buyer in California is around 40, 35 to 40. Mm -hmm. So, how does that home search differ? And and they're because uh, we talked about communication, but what are they really doing to find a home? You say they're texting you properties yeah. and whatnot, but are they are they reading ads? You know, are they are they looking oh, at gosh. open house online? How does that behavior yeah, differ? The, Sometimes um, the newspaper ads are, are still relevant, but the problem with those just in this market is that um, by the time the newspaper ad comes out, there's already 12 offers on the property. So um, I do my best to, to get them to do the property alerts and, um, uh, and me be able to email the properties, because even most buyers do have email addresses, whether they're old, young, whatever. Um, it's just a matter of whether they check it on a daily basis or if there's, you know, as involved an email as the younger buyers are. Um, but, um, yeah, it's to be able to email a property versus, or have them on a property alert, which I do for mm -hmm. almost all my clients have them on a property alert. Right. Um, and then to search the MLS and actually email properties is such a huge time saver. Um, but for the older generation, sometimes I'll have the initial, um, buyers and kind of buyers interview with them, find out exactly what they're looking for. And a lot of times I have to be the eyes for them. Mm -hmm. um, if I see a property online and I really think it's something that they're gonna like, then I'll call them with a property address. Some of them want to do a drive by or we'll just go meet over there and check them out. But your but younger buyers it sounds like are more on top of it. They're out oh, yeah, there, they're more. looking. They're yeah. daily, they're yeah. hourly and they're texting yeah. you information whereas the buyers, yeah, the baby boomers, the older are a little more passive yep. and they're expecting you to be more yep. take charge yep. in their home search. And, and I know when I bought my house, um, the uh, it was fun for me to be searching the internet and um, and for my husband he he actually found that our house for me when I was out showing property and he texted me and said, Oh, there's a new one. Um, so, yeah. Did you get right back to them? Oh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I was, I was showing property. I texted them and said, show property. I'll call you right back. And then we went and saw the house that day and went and written off on it that day and a couple days later it was accepted. So, mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, it's... Um, so, you know, the, the behavior, we were talking about the behavior of a buyer, and, and I think you've answered it, you know, that, that the younger buyer is out there daily, hourly, and, and it's really something that they are very much more interactive. So in a way, 
it's a little more challenging for you as an agent, I would imagine, because you've got to get back right away. You yeah. are bombarded. Okay, yeah. you use that word, bombarded. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very bombarded. So you think that in terms of your working with a Gen Y, 20-something buyer, I mean, how much more of your time would you say is oh, involved gosh, yeah. versus, so say, baby more. boomer? Is yeah, it? so much more. Um, and it's nice because I can respond, and I do have a computer that I can um, look a laptop and I can look it up all, you know from my house or do whatever um, so that is nice it is it is a time saver in in an essence mm -hmm. but it's also I mean just the expectations are are so much different in in expecting me to respond right away and there and you have to set yourself apart because there are so many agents to choose from if you they don't have somebody that does respond right away, um, you know, then they, they may very well go somewhere else. Okay, so they're, they're, they're demanding, they bombard you, um, they, they uh, do you do a lot of hand-holding with these Gen Y, or are they out there learning more about the home buying experience on their own through all the information that's available on the Internet? Um, I'd say both, especially when it comes to the paperwork, um, because that's not something that they can just Google online and find information out about the paperwork. Um, so when we do go over contract stuff together, Sometimes, if it's not feasible for us to be in person together, we'll do it over the phone. But I do try my best to um, walk them through the disclosures, walk them through the, the contract and really important things, um, rather than just, here's all the paperwork, go figure it out yourself. Yeah, um, yeah. thanks a lot. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I think as far as that goes, um, I'm, I'm really involved there. But definitely when it comes to just finding the properties, um, they're, they're out there constantly doing it themselves. So it sounds, so does it help you to be a Gen Y yourself? Oh, definitely. How so? Yeah. Um, I can relate so much more with them. Um, because you're, because you're ADD and they're ADD, right? Yeah, exactly. With a little yeah, bit of, yeah, we're, yeah. We're, yeah, I'm like always have to constantly be busy. Yeah. And, um, and it works well because it seems like they always are. It's too. a match. It's a match yeah. to that demographic. No, it's a great match. And, um, my youngest buyer was 21. And um, it was a husband and wife and a brand new little baby. So they were they were so cute. Um, and, and even with them too, they actually were over at my house a few weeks ago. And the thing that really helps me being that same age group is not only can I relate to them, but we all just become really really good friends. Mm -hmm. And it works works nicely that um, they because they see me as friends. They always want to send me referrals and. Because it's not just, I'm not just the realtor, I'm their good friend. You know, you hit on something that is, is very true. I was talking to another agent, Chris Kamali, in, in Pleasanton the other day, and he's an agent that does a lot of work with uh, Gen Y as well. And one of the things that Chris said was that he, he, people are looking for people that want to be their friends. They, they have to spend a lot of time with someone through this mm -hmm. transaction. And that's something that differs with baby boomers. I don't think the baby boomers expect to become personal friends yeah. as much yeah. um, with their realtor. Yeah. They want their realtor, they do want to like their realtor, mm -hmm. they want to be able to get along with them, they want to be able to, you know, they're going to spend a lot of time in the car and on the phone with them, but it's not a, a prerequisite that they feel yeah. like this is someone I need to be become mm -hmm. personal friends with, which yeah, is an interesting right. transition. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. And that's actually, um, I, it probably has to do with my age, but even when I do have the buyers that aren't 20s and early 30s, um, I really stay in touch with them. I sold a house here in Pleasanton. Um, and my, my client was older, and I still send her emails and, and see how she's doing. She was super excited to find out that I was pregnant, and just staying in touch with them. Mm -hmm. um, even even the older generation, I still try to try to be their friend, and and sometimes it's kind of awkward because you know you, you get probably more really like a daughter. School. Yeah, you know, seriously, I'm sure <laughs> and that's that okay too. I do have some clients like that who I know just just totally see me as a daughter, but right. in, but in a good way. Yeah, yeah. right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, one of the one of the things that I think we're challenged with as an industry is we are not as good as we could be. We're not very good at all, matter of fact, in really staying in touch with our past clients. And it, what you hit on is so key. Um, you know, it used to be that, you know, the average transaction would happen every five years, and now it's gone to seven, maybe even mm -hmm. nine years. So it's hard for an agent to close a transaction and think, I'm going to be, I may not tr close a transaction with this person again for seven, eight, nine years. I don't need to really stay in touch with them right now. Oh, yeah, and that's not at all, um, I I don't do that because um, even if, if it's not them personally that you're going to do a transaction with, if you're staying in front of them and keeping in touch with them, um, that's that's when you get more referrals. The referrals and right. I had a client who I had sold him a house in Danville that was, um, and I think I checked in with him about a month after he moved in and just sent him an email, hey, how you doing, how's the house going, things like that. And um, he wrote me back and said, hey, our neighbors are looking at the moving. 
go stop by this address. Mm -hmm. So my business partner and I stopped over at that address and we got the listing. Right. So um, staying in touch with them is, is it's paid really, off. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, it's big time paid off. And um, I do pop buys twice a year okay. so, to all my past clients. So okay. So in terms of staying in touch with your past clients, what I'm hearing is you pop buys twice a year. Mm -hmm. You just randomly call every once in a while. Mm -hmm. I do that too. Send you, Christmas cards. Send Christmas cards. Do you mm -hmm. put them on any kind of an electronic follow up system, or is yeah. it more personal? Um, I I have done that when I first got in the business, but I haven't done that since. Mm -hmm because I just don't feel that they really want their inbox mm -hmm. full of, of stuff. Like I do the, the quarterly market reports mm -hmm. to some, mm -hmm. and then, um, and actually sometimes I'll get a an email back, oh, hey, good to hear from you, how you doing? Um, but more than more than that, what I found to be successful is, is like I'll send a, a spring forward, a fall back, a, mm -hmm. a Christmas card, and then two Popeyes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay, good, that's, that's a good mix. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. All right, so here's a big question with you alluded to um, a minute ago, you know, that the market has changed dramatically and, um, you know, young buyers, first time home buyers especially, find themselves in very challenging situations up against, um, you know, multiple bidding situations where they've got a bit over list and in many cases up against a cash buyer. Mm -hmm. So how do you coach your buyers to cope with this and how are they doing and what, what is their threshold? Um, and I think a lot of why this is really hard, especially if a younger buyer is talking to their parents about buying their first home. I know my mom was completely clueless to the fact that this has now become a seller's market. Um, couldn't believe that, that we're getting multiple offers on everything. So if they've already talked to somebody else, I think it kind of becomes a surprise when they hear somebody that's actually in the industry dealing with this on a daily basis. Um, but the way that I... Um, the way that I kind of coach them for that is the very first conversation that I have, whether it's like a phone call lead, it's a, a referral or something like that, um, the first conversation that I ever have with them is I just set the expectation of what the market is like right now. Mm -hmm. um, I set the expectation that we are seeing multiple offers on every property. I, I let them know, you know, if you've been out there looking and you've seen, there's really not a lot of stuff on the market right now. So because of, it's, it, because of the supply and demand, um, it has become a seller's market, and we're seeing tons of offers on everything, um, over list price, because a lot of buyers are used to the market of a couple of years ago where it was a buyer's market, and they could come in under asking, the properties were sitting there, um, but that's not at all what the market is like anymore. So, so, so do you coach your buyers sometimes to avoid certain situations or making offers because if they're not in a, in a position where they can overbid it's going to be a very frustrating oh yeah definitely them. and that's really hard when you see a property that's like if they're looking at 250 and oh here's a property at 260 and they really really want to see it but I have to explain to them you know especially a lot of it depends on whether it's a short sale um, who the bank is if I know okay they're going to take a cash offer over you know an FHA offer if there's already 15 offers on it it, I don't want to waste their time in having them fall in love with the property and then um, and then them not be able to get it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Absolutely. Okay. All right, good. So let's go to um, Brittany's tips. So these are Brittany's tips for working effectively with today's young home buyers. So we have covered all these already, but let's just kind of do a summary, Brittany, of important to text. You've got to be comfortable working with texting, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah, definitely. That's one of the texting and emailing, and especially with the smartphones that it's on your phone, um, they do expect immediate responses. And by immediate, you don't mean uh, three hours. You don't no. mean, uh, let me no, call, gosh, let yeah, me text them back after lunch. No, no yeah. you mean even if minutes. I'm in the middle of lunch, I'll send them a text message and just say, hey, I'm eating lunch, I'll get back to you, I'll get back to my office. Wow, okay, so yeah. that's, that's, that's a good tip is yeah. even if you can't answer their question, Got it. I'll mm -hmm. I'll respond as soon as I'm out of my meeting. Yeah. They, I think they appreciate that because I, yeah. they know that okay I'm busy, but at least I'm, I'm there's I'm someone here there. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Good. Holding their hand, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to the paperwork. Okay. Um, there a lot of time. I I going down to the last point. I do work a lot hand in hand with a lender because I had one client tell me she didn't understand anything the lender was saying, so I have to kind of translate things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so holding their hand in in that way, yeah. Okay, and be, being their friend. Yep. You know, that's again that's. That's uh, that's different than uh, I'd say ten, five, even five years ago for, yeah. for a lot of realtors. 
Um, and then we're kind of going all over here with the internet. And, and when you say the internet, you mean the drip emails, the property alerts? Property alerts, and then sending properties, whether if I pull them off the MLS and then send them directly from the MLS. Got you. Okay. Yeah. All right, good. Well, this has been great. I, I do have to say one thing that I noticed that Brittany's doing, which is different than any other agent that we've had <laughs> in here. It's cute. And this, this really does tell, is a testament to her being a, a, a Gen Y uh, 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 realtor. She has, every uh, person that comes in here to do the radio show usually has handwritten notes on a piece of paper. Brittany's got her notes in her iPhone. She's scrolling up and down. So uh, everything truly is mobile, as Mark, as Mark was saying, with this generation. So Brittany, thank you so much. You are a fountain of knowledge, and uh, congratulations on your um, soon-to-be-born boy or girl. Do we know what it is yet? Find out Wednesday. Find out Wednesday. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much. Thank I really you. appreciate you coming in today. Um, and before we wrap up, I am going to um, talk a little bit about the um, Wednesday trainings that we have. Um, we do have a what's called a Need to Know Wednesday training. And it happens every Wednesday in, our, in the Stone Ridge location at 5960, which is actually not far from our headquarters. Um, I encourage any agent that's interested in learning um, anything from listing presentation, short sellers, buyer representation. We have, there are different marketing classes. Every single Wednesday from 10 to 12, it's free. Uh, please put it on your calendar. These are the topics for the month of December. We'll be posting the topics for the month of January very soon and sending out a flyer as well. But these are all taught by subject matter experts, whether it's very experienced agents or our experienced managers. So uh, this is the schedule coming up. Uh, we are giving you the day after Christmas off, but uh, please uh, plan on coming in. You do not need to sign up in advance. Uh, just stop by our Need to Know training. And with that, uh, that concludes our, uh, our uh, radio show for today. You can see our upcoming show next week, Stand Your Ground and Commission Negotiations. We've got Adele Gillis from Piedmont. Um, and the following week, business planning. Jim O'Neill is going to talk about how to really set up that business plan for next year. And then Debbie DiMaggio is going to come in and talk about how she has reinvented herself. Um, so thanks very much for tuning in today. And everyone have a great Thanksgiving holiday. Bye-bye.